When I was 11 years old, I turned on the radio late at night, and I tuned to a show called Coast to Coast AM. Is anybody familiar with that? Obviously. So I tuned it on, and I heard this gentleman on the radio with Art Bell at the time. This is Terrence McKenna. I'm, I'm not even going to do it justice. But he brought so many things to my attention that at 11 years old, mind you, created this open mind, this journey that has been so fulfilling. And Dennis, his brother, has been there from the very beginning. And I, I hate to even invoke Terrence, but he's a big part of you and your work. And his recent book describes it in great detail. Dennis, of course, unto himself, is an amazing and theogenic researcher. He's an amazing thinker. His talk we've talked off air about is absolutely brilliant and absolutely appropriate for this conference beyond belief. We talked about a lot of different options, and I think he has the one that matters, waking up the monkeys. Without further ado, Dennis McKenna. Good afternoon. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I thank you. Uh, how many of you are at, at the point of exhaustion? <laughs> we're, we're coming down to the wire here. It's been an amazing, stimulating, interesting weekend. Uh, I'm a little embarrassed. I, you know, the, some of these acts are a hard act to follow. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what I'm going to talk about, well, I want to say a couple things. Let's get the shameless self-promotion stuff out of the way, shall we? So, as Bob mentioned, I have written a uh, memoir called The Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss. You've probably seen me out there flogging books at the table. There are eight copies left. Don't make me take them home. <laughs> that, would, that would be great. But also, thank all of you who did buy it. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you'll get your money's worth. Uh, I want to also just mention the Hefter Research Institute here, uh, www.hefter with two Fs, hefter.org. It's a nonprofit organization that I was a founding board member of in 1992, so we're well out in well over 20 years now. It, some of you have heard of MAPS, which is much better known, uh, but the Hefter is a smaller outfit, but in a way we're more focused on the science, less on the politics and, and activism. Most of the leading researchers in psychedelic work right now are on our board or being uh, supported by us partially. We're a nonprofit. Basically, we're trying to raise enough funds to support research on psychedelics for therapeutic purposes. but. You know, as we all know, it, it doesn't go, it doesn't end there, but, but that's what we're doing. And if you want to know what's going on, go to the Hefter Research Institute, hefter.org, and just uh, have a look. Uh, so in my talk today, uh, it's going to be different from most of what you've been hearing here. It's going to be a little more science-y, uh, but there's uh, plenty of speculation mixed in. With that, uh, I'm not channeling it from any source. Uh, the beings of light don't talk to me anymore, so I'm forced to rely on sort of my own ideas. Uh, but I want to bring together a th kind of three different threads, if I can, and see how these fit together, or if they do. And feel free to disagree, and I'm sure there's no one in this audience who would hesitate to disagree. It was a pretty contentious bunch. Uh, uh, but I want to talk about neural evolution, the evolution of the human brain and consciousness. I want to talk about plant-human co-evolution and symbiosis. And I want to talk about how this may have influenced the evolution of consciousness and where is it going now? What, what, uh, what are the importance of these ancient plant uh, psychedelics, these ancient shamanic medicines, if you want to call them. Uh, what, is, what is the role now at this pivotal uh, 
uh, time in human history? Do they still have a role or, or what's going on? So, so that's kind of the, uh, the thrust of my talk. I'm going to make that a little brighter. And so uh, we'll just get into it. So the brain. Uh, the brain is an amazing organ. Uh, it is, in fact, the most complex object, the most complex structure that we know in the known universe. And uh, if you know anything about uh, uh, general systems theory and organismic uh, uh, philosophy and all that, complex systems often reflect emergent properties such as life and consciousness. And the brain is one of the most complex objects we know, and we know, or we think we know, that the brain is also conscious, at least most of the time, at least in some of us. Uh, but just some gee whiz statistics to help you appreciate this. Uh, that, you know, the brain communicates through synapses, which are the, the junctions between nerve cells. These structures here where neurotransmitters get released and cross a, that synaptic gap, that synaptic junction, and bind to receptors on uh, the other side. And there are many, many different kinds of receptors in the brain, about 50 different types of neurotransmitters. And this is how the brain communicates, is through this neuronal synaptically connection, connected network. And so synapses in the brain are like the communications nodes, you can think of it that way. There's 500, what, between 100 and 500 trillion synapses in the brain. So that's more connections than all of the computers and all of the routers on the internet. If we want to compare that to another complex object, uh, the Milky Way galaxy, just again for comparison, the Milky Way galaxy only contains about 100 billion stars, only 100 billion stars. If each synapse in the brain is analogous to a star, our brains are the equivalent of 1,000 galaxies. So again, just gee whiz, uh, but you know, the brain has been called the three pound universe, and in some ways it really is, the universe within. Well, this extraordinarily complex primate brain, the other interesting thing about the, this extraordinarily complex brain appearing on Earth, most complex object we've ever uh, run into, is that in terms of evolutionary time, it developed over an astonishingly short evolutionary span compared to other uh, evolutionary processes. So if you look at neural evolution, if you look at the timeline of neural evolution, you get an idea for it. Here, on this uh, scale here is millions of years. On this scale down here, which I know a lot of you can't see because of the seating arrangement, but this is the brain capacity in cubic centimeters. So. It all started, well, it started quite a, bit, quite a ways back, but the first true humans, the first true hominids, as they say, they were not homo sapiens, they were not our species, but it started about two million years ago, and one of the earliest representatives was Homo habilis. And she, actually, she, the fossil that was found, had a brain capacity, uh, 700, 800 cubic centimeters, so a relatively small brain, but definitely human, probably used primitive tools, probably walked on two legs. And then there are all these other precursors and so on, and the next one that's kind of significant is Homo erectus. And Homo erectus oh, originated maybe 1.8 million years ago and probably died out about 100,000 years ago. So Homo erectus had a long run. In fact, of all these hominids, including us, Homo erectus uh, was around for a longer time. So, and Homo erectus was global. I mean, the oldest, one of the oldest excavations of Homo erectus took place not in, Af in Africa, but in Java. So Java man, you've probably heard of Java man, that's Homo erectus. 
And so Homo erectus was all over the place. When you get contemporary, you've got Homo sapiens and you've got Homo neanderthalensis, the Neanderthals. These were contemporary, basically, and Neanderthal even had a somewhat bigger brain than the Homo sapiens because bigger, bigger uh, brute in a way, bigger head, bigger, bigger body and everything else. These probably interbred, uh, but they had, compared to Homo habilis, uh, they had a brain capacity between 1,400 and 1,500 cubic centimeters. So in an astonishingly short period, of evolutionary time, the size of the human brain and the complexity of the human brain literally exploded. And what gave rise to that? What, how did that come about? What were the evolutionary factors that pushed us to this? Well, we'll get to that in a minute, but I want to, again, sing the praises of the human brain and also discuss a little bit how different that makes us from any other animal species in nature. We are an anomaly in nature. We're the only species with a complex language. We're the only species that utilizes technology. And I'm not talking about digging sticks to get, you know, termites out of logs. I'm talking about computers and starships and kind of stuff that we create. We are the only species able to store information outside of ourselves and transmit it non-genetically to future generations and also across space. In other words, we invented writing and through language we invented oral traditions and we invented all this way to codify information. Uh, animals don't do that. I don't think animals have an oral tradition or then they certainly don't do writing. So we're different. And we're different partly because we're the only species for whom symbols, ideas, abstractions are as real as the physical world. We are immersed in an ocean of symbols and ideas. And we are preoccupied with them. And this ability to attribute meaning to symbols, if you will, is the foundation of human culture. And culture is another thing, another aspect of human beings that sets us apart from other species on Earth. Culture is an edifice that's comprised of art, science, religion, magic, myth, medicine, technology, folklore, law, a few other things I probably forgot. But this is what sets us apart from other biological species is a complex culture. And if it weren't for language, we wouldn't have culture. And if it weren't for the extraordinarily complex brain that we have, we wouldn't be a linguistic species. Neuroanatomists can tell us that large percentage of the human brain, this modern, neurologically modern human brain, are devoted to the generation of and or the comprehension of language. Huge sections of the neocortex, which is the evolutionarily most recent. So this situation has led us to the, the, the problematic primate, what I like to call the problematic primate. That's us. We have a number of characteristics. We have this extraordinarily hypertrophied brain, this overexpressed complex brain. However that came about, we have it, we are blessed with it, or perhaps we're cursed with it. We have, as a result of that brain, we have complex language. We have symbolic thinking. We are a creative, artistic species. We put our consciousness out into the world by making artifacts and by making artistic expressions. Uh, you have to be conscious to do that. That's, a, that's what conscious beings do, not animals. As well as being creative and artistic, we're also aggressive and warlike. We are technological. Uh, we are fascinated with technology and we have these opposable thumbs that can get us into all kinds of trouble. Uh, we're religious and spiritual as a species. We have a, an inner life, a spiritual life. Oops, how'd that happen? Sorry. Uh, anyway. Yeah, and so th this is how we are, and uh, we have this, 
but the other the other side of the point is that we're extremely clever. We're extremely clever as we know, but we're not very wise. And this is a problem. And by that I mean that our cleverness has, outstri has outstripped our wisdom. We now have control of technology that could literally destroy this planet. We do not have as yet the wisdom to use those technologies, but we have the technologies. So uh, this is part of the big challenge for humanity at this juncture is to close that gap between wisdom and technology so that we can, <laughs> well, for one thing, avoid destroying the planet, which we're busy doing right now, and uh, you know, learn to use these tremendous tools that we've developed in a way that's wise, in a way that benefits people. So we'll keep that in mind. Now I want to talk about plants a little bit. I'm a plant biochemist. I'm a botanist by training. And, uh, and plants are pretty darn amazing, if you think about it. Uh, for one thing, plants have mastered a process that few other organisms on the planet have, and we should be very grateful that they have, they have mastered photosynthesis. And photosynthesis is the process by which plants can harvest sunlight and use the energy of sunlight to make complex organic molecules. And luckily for us, they do this. This is the way that energy is brought into the biosphere and from the sun and brought into the biochemical networks that hold the biosphere together. Uh, and really, the Earth is, you can think of it as one huge organism. It's one huge cell. The whole Earth is alive. And I dare say the whole Earth is conscious. So plants have mastered this process. They can make an enormous variety of these organic molecules from sunlight, carbon, uh, water, and carbon dioxide. And incidentally, uh, this is also the main thing that's sequestering carbon out of the biosphere, out of the atmosphere, into biological matrices, and it's maintaining the CO2 balance, the carbon balance, in the atmosphere that we're putting under such strain by putting all these human-generated uh, greenhouse gases. It's estimated that the tropical forest deforestation, the cutting down of the rainforest, and not only the cutting down, but then the burning of what's there, releases all that carbon back into the atmosphere. That accounts for about 30% of so-called anthropogenic, that is human-caused uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So you want to put that to a stop? You want to bring that to slow that down? Put the fires out. Uh, you know, stop burning the rainforest. It's uh, pretty simple. We know what the solution is. The, 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 you know, but it's complex for political reasons to put that to an end. Anyway, this just is a little more. Uh, I think I explained it all. Chlorophyll, harvest the light, use the light energy to make these complex organic compounds. And the guy says, uh, well, now I know how come plants never get fat. Well, plants are light eaters. Haha, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so. I am not going to go through this in detail. There's not going to be a test, but this just shows some of the uh, complex biosynthetic pathway that leads from carbon dioxide plus water plus sol solar energy leads first to sugars and carbohydrates. And these blue boxes are what they call primary metabolism, meaning they're pretty much universal in organisms, all plants, all animals. And these are the molecules of life. These are the things that sustain life. What's interesting about plants is they make all these so-called secondary compounds, which are not universally found in all plants. They're only found in some plants, in certain species, certain families, and so on. So we know they're not necessary for life. But what do plants do with all these secondary compounds? Which, incidentally, some of them are quite uh, useful to us, like for example, the alkaloids, the nitrogen-containing secondary products, source of many important medicines to us. Originally, nature's pharmacy was plants. Now we've largely replaced that with 
with synthetics, but they're still important. Phenolic compounds, terpenoids, the sources of like many fragrances and colors and pigments and things like that. It's not too wild an exaggeration to say that we value plants often because of their chemical properties. Basically, it's plant chemistry that makes plants interesting to us. And it's not just things we might ingest. It's, it's the pigments they put out and the other things. Well, what do plants do with all these secondary compounds? Why do they bother to make them? Because, you know, it costs metabolic energy to, to make these compounds. Well, here's what they do with them. The language of plants is chemistry. And plants have substituted biosynthesis, this biosynthetic ability for behavior, because plants are stuck in one place. They can't run away from predators. They can't get up and fight. They're pretty much stuck. So they use these secondary metabolites as messenger molecules that mediate their relationships with other organisms in the environment. This is the language of plants. This is how they make their way in the world. And those include, for example, other plants. They send chemical messages through the soil, through the atmosphere. Fungi and microorganisms that might be in relationship to the plant. For example, in the rhizosphere, the part of the plant that's in the ground. Insects. Insects is a huge, well, we know insects are important to plants because they, they pollinate many plants, right? And biochemical coevolution between plants and insects goes back hundreds, well, a hundred million years, a couple hundred million years anyway. So very complex. Herbivores also. Uh, herbivores are things that might want to nibble on the plant you know, might want to eat it, and that includes us. I mean, humans, we might want to consume it for food or for drugs or whatever purposes. So we're in, we're in that category. And what they uh, use, what they do these for, that they have various purposes which are not necessarily, they're kind of overlapping. These are not strictly uh, separate categories. They use these secondary compounds for defense, in other words, a repellent function, the signal is stay away, just leave me alone. I don't want to be eaten. I don't want to be molested, right? Uh, and so I produce bad tasting compounds. Uh, They're used for semiosis. All of this is semiosis. Semiosis as in semaphore, that means they send a signal. These are signaling. Signal transduction molecules. Signal transduction is very important in biological systems. We usually hear it talked about in terms of the nervous system or other systems, but this is signal transduction in the ecology uh, and or symbiosis. Sometimes plants use these chemical compounds as a signal to not to say stay away, but to come closer. Let's you and I symbiose if you want to make that a verb. Let's get closer together for mutual benefit. That's the close association of different species for mutual benefit. That's usually what it is. For example, just a sim well, the insect uh, plant uh, symbiosis is a great example. The insect gets nectar and, and uh, you know, is attracted to the plant. It, it gets nectar so it can make honey. And it pollinates the plant in the process. It completes the plant's sexual reproductive cycle, so it does it this, this favor. It wouldn't be able to do it otherwise. If we had to have a third species give uh, help us complete our reproductive cycle, we'd think that was pretty kinky. But for plants, this is, this is how it is, you know? So these are the kind of main, uh, you know, functions. And so when we come to humans and we consider how humans have evolved immersed in this chemical ecology. Think of the whole ecosystem, the whole biosphere, is really a chemical ecology mediated through plant chemistry. And when it comes to these problematic primates and our evolution, we have kind of this sequence here. Secondary compounds in plants, toxins, other compounds, have lead, are eaten by humans, so we have human dietary exposure. And from that, we have various effects, direct effects, I'm talking over evolutionary time, direct effects on the phenotype, 
the phenotype being the expression of genes. We learn recognition and avoidance and repulsion mechanisms. We learn behaviors to avoid harmful plants. We develop folk technologies to detoxify plants so that we can eat them. Look at the processing of manioc, for example. There are physiological detoxification mechanisms. The stomach, the whole organism can adapt to the plants that you're eating. That's what makes everybody a biochemical individual, right? We're all unique in that sense. And there are also effects on the genotype. These effects on the other side lead ultimately to alterations in gene structure. There's feedback to the genome. There's molecular changes as a result of your chemical exposure to specific gene products. In other words, enzymes and hormones. There's a whole array of inducible enzymes in the liver. The genetic ability to make those things, the coding to make those things is there, but it's not induced, it's not expressed until you get exposed to the toxin and then it's activated. So this has long-term consequences in over evolutionary time. These two processes lead to initiated variations in diverse metabolic processes, modifications in disease susceptibility, changes in individual and group biological fitness, ultimately shifts in gene frequencies that are based on differential survival reproduction. In other words, the whole survival of the fittest, the most adapted genes. I mean, uh, do, you know, in those populations do tend to uh, foster better, better reproduction. So these all have evolutionary consequences, these effects over evolutionary time. Okay, so let's back up again. Let's put that on the shelf for a minute. Let's back up and talk again about the brain. Let's talk about neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters, as I mentioned before, are these small molecules that mediate the crosstalk between neurons. And all of the brain's critical biochemical functions, including our experience of consciousness, is mediated by this neuronal uh, communications network. Well, the neurotransmitters in the brain are the targets for psychoactive drugs. And in fact, that's because we are made of drugs. The uh, brain is an engine that runs on neurotransmitters and hormones. Those are drugs, basically. Those are drugs. And that's why drugs, psychoactive drugs, synthetic or whatever, they work by affecting neurotransmitters, the synthesis or the storage, the release, the degradation, the reuptake, and most often and pr probably most importantly here is they mimic the effect of the endogenous neurotransmitters. So uh, these neurotransmitters and these plant messenger molecules, they evolved from the same evolutionary precursors and they probably serve similar functions. In other words, in the ecosystem, these neurotransmitter precursors served an external function, signaling function in the ecosystem, but then for the brain, they're good signalers, so they've been internalized and repurposed to the function of internal signal transduction. So it isn't surprising that plants contain a lot of compounds that are like neurotransmitters. And they look like neurotransmitters chemically, and guess what? They interact with brain neurotransmitters. Such as, for example, serotonin. This is one of the more interesting ones from our standpoint. Serotonin is a very simple molecule derived from the amino acid tryptophan, which is in all animals, all, all organisms. It's one of the 20 that goes into proteins. So serotonin is very close relative of, of uh, tryptophan. It's thought to be the oldest neurotransmitter, phylogenetically speaking. And we know from behavioral studies and all sorts of studies that it's, it's one of the master neurotransmitters. It regulates processes such as sleep, dreams, attention, perception, mood, sexual behavior, eating behavior, a lot of the things that we experience uh, as experience in the process of, of being human beings. And this network of serotonin neurons uh, originates in the brain stem and it articulates or arborizes throughout the brain. 
And we know that it links brain areas that are known to be involved in conscious experience, parts of the brain, such as the limbic system, the hypothalamus, the neocortex, and so on. There are about 14 different subtypes of serotonin identified in the brain, serotonin receptors, that is. The serotonin is the same in all, but the receptors are different. Also in the body, there's actually more serotonin in the gut, for example, than there is in the brain. Uh, but, but there are about 14 different types of them, and as it turns out, the classical psychedelics, which are also largely indoles, like serotonin, and tryptophan derivatives, like serotonin, things like LSD and psilocybin and DMT, they interact selectively with a particular subtype of these serotonin receptors that's known as the 5-HT2A receptors. 5-HT is short for 5-hydroxytryptamine. That's just another chemical name for serotonin. So these psychedelics that we ingest from the natural world are messenger molecules. And they are targeting that very neural, chem neural transmitter that mediates consciousness in the brain of these problematic primates. So they are actually sending a message to us from nature. Psychedelics, the natural science of psychedelics, are trying to send a message to our species and has been for we don't know how long, possibly possibly 100,000 years. It's not clear. I mean, it's lost in prehistory. But if they're trying to send a message, what is the message? What are we, uh, what do they uh, want us to know? Well, the message, first of all, is symbiosis, baby. Organisms want to form symbiotic relationships with the problematic primate for mutual benefit. For the plants or the fungi or whatever that form these symbioses, and this isn't just uh, restricted to psychoactive drug, any plant that we find useful as food, as fiber, as construction material, whatever, that plant is useful to our species and it, it's a great, in a way, great lucky break for the plant if we say this plant's important enough that we're going to learn to grow it and we're going to you know, develop agriculture around it and uh, then it's taken away from the vicissitudes of natural selection and it's taken under humanity's wing. It's now subject to artificial selection, which we do, which we subject them to all kinds of artificial selection. But basically, it has an evolutionary free ride for a while with this symbiotic relationship uh, until we manage to completely toxify the planet and, you know, and, and we're working on that. We won't have to wait much longer. Uh, but it's good for the plants and it's good to, uh, for us that we have these symbiotic uh, relationships. There are a few other messages that come from these plant teachers. Indigenous people that use these hallucinogens or psychedelics is the term I prefer, uh, shamanic medicines perhaps. Uh, indigenous people that, that use these things call them plant teachers. These are considered a source of wisdom, and the plants have things to teach us, and boy, do they teach us. Uh, but they have some other messages here. A few other messages from our sponsors. Our sponsors are the plants. First of all, wake up, you monkeys. You're wrecking the place. That's a big one, and that one's becoming a little more strident as we get closer to you know, global environmental collapse. So that's one of the messages. And they say, you monkeys only think you're running the show. <laughs> Important to remember that. Remember that the plants are running the show, among other things. But the plants are a biggie because everything on the, in the ecosystem, we're basically all parasites on plants. Life on Earth would not exist if it weren't for photosynthesis. So the plants are pretty much running the show. If they went on strike tomorrow, uh, you know, we wouldn't be very happy because not only do they fix carbon, but they generate oxygen in that process. So that's a pretty heavy symbiosis. And another message is never forget how little you monkeys know. You know, uh, psychedelics, if you're listening, if you take something like ayahuasca, 
uh, one of the things you're going to take away with is this realization of how little we know the limitations of our knowledge. It never fails to remind me of me of that anyway. Just remember, you don't know shit, <laughs> right? And that's good. That's good to remind ourselves of that. Because that means that there's a lot to learn. And I love learning. I love finding out new things. So that's like not a depressing message. That's great. I don't know anything. So I'm, the decks are cleared. I can learn. We all can approach it in that way once we've had that sort of dressing down by, you know, the school marm, the teacher, you know. And another message I didn't put on here, but maybe it's worth saying, is never forget that you're monkeys. You know, we tend to think that there's something special about us. Not really, you know. So... I may be speaking to a younger audience here, uh, uh, and so I don't know how many people will recognize this sort of iconic image. Uh, but this is the monolith from the movie 2001, uh, and by Stanley Kubrick. And uh, as you know, the monolith was uh, a device, a dramatic device in 2001, literally a deus ex machina as the theatrical people call it, a machine from God. Didn't say it was from God, but the monolith was something that appeared at critical junctures in human history, and it was utterly alien. It was totally incomprehensible. It was completely outside the ken of human experience. And as a result of that, it was terrifying. We could not look upon it but neither could we look away, right? And the monolith in the movie was, corresponds to what Rudolf Otto, the philosopher, called the mysterium tremendum ex fascinum, the fascinating and mysterious mystery. And that's what it was. And it, 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 it showed up, you know, on the Serengeti plane about the time we were figuring out how to turn, you know, bones into weapons, and then it showed up in, on a crater on the moon, and then around the orbit of Jupiter and all that, if you're familiar with that story. So it showed up at critical moments in human history, this catalytic, tremendous mystery, incomprehensible, but always drawing us forward to nudge us forward in cognitive evolution at critical moments. Well, you don't need to go to Jupiter to find the monolith, because something very similar, essentially the same thing, has always existed in nature. And uh, it's co-evolved with us. Uh, this is the Psilocybe cubensis, one of the more common, one of the most common of the psilocybin mushrooms. This is globally distributed. Just about any pasture in the tropics or subtropics that has cattle in it you can wander out and you can find this mushroom because the, the dung, the shit of the cattle is what they love to grow on. So this is everywhere. This is a very common, this is pan-globally distributed. And it's big. It's not something hiding in the bushes. These things can get six or eight feet. They can have caps, uh, you know, uh, eight or nine uh, inches in diameter, and they're golden. I mean, they're, they're beautiful mushrooms. They're hard not to notice. And if you're a hungry primate looking for something to eat, you're not going to pass up something like that. It looks delicious. Not only does it look delicious, it, it is delicious. It's not too, yeah, a little bitter, but it's not too bad. You can make a nice omelet out of this. But when the... Seriously, try it sometime. It's, it's called blue, blue omelet. Blue omelet. Maybe if you own a restaurant. Well, you can actually order these things in, in, in Thailand. But, uh, so once the primate made that connection and had that experience, whether accidentally or maybe, well, first of all, it had to be accidental. And I, I suggest that mushrooms were the most ancient uh, of humanity's first encounters with psychedelics because they require no preparation. They don't require any technology at all. Their other things are hard to prepare. Ayahuasca is a big deal. 
you have to know what you're doing to make that. Mushrooms, you just wander out into the field and pick them. So, you know, if you can be bothered to bend over and pick up the damn mushroom, you know, then the connection is going to be made. And, and you're going to have that experience and you're going to, holy shit, you know, come back to your villagers and say, guess what, guys and gals, what I just found out. And probably on that level, it probably was a, a, a girl that, that found it, a woman, because the women, well, we don't want to get into that, but they're probably responsible for most of the significant discoveries of, uh, that have advanced evolution, and uh, there's good reason for that. Uh, uh, so once this psychedelic was discovered, the knowledge propagated rather quickly in history. Again, another explosion, not on the level of uh, hundreds of thousands of years, but maybe on a, the level of maybe a few tens of thousands of years, because if you look at cultures around the world, you can see that these psychedelics were uh, suddenly, it, it spread like the whole mon hundredth monkey idea. You know, we find these mushroom shamans and these iconographic images of mushrooms in the Tassali Plateau in Algeria, it goes back 8,000 BC. These ancient peyote buttons go back Six to you know four to six thousand BC. These miniature mushroom stones in Guatemala again, three thousand BC, possibly older than that. The San Pedro cactus at uh, in the excavations at Chavín in Peru, thirteen hundred BC. The the hallucinogenic snuffs, the uh, Sibyl snuffs in Corral five to 8,000 BC, these cave paintings uh, that show these iconic mushroom uh, silhouettes here at the Selva Pascuala cave in Spain. This is uh, 4,000, 6,000, 8,000 BC. Uh, so actually, that's, all that's pretty far back, but it probably went back a lot further than that. This is what's survived. And uh, so this knowledge was there, and this knowledge permeated the world, was transmitted through, through culture and through just this ability to um, exchange information. And so humanity got in touch with its plant teachers. This is a, this is a uh, painting by Pablo Amaringo, a famous uh, Peruvian uh, visionary artist and an ayahuascaro. And this instantiates the understanding of within that particular shamanic tradition that these plants are intelligent beings, they are teachers, and they're here to help us learn. And we are here to learn from them. They are trying to shepherd humanity through you know, evolutionary time. Toward what? We're not sure, but hopefully toward survival. And so this concept of the plant teachers has always been with us. And interestingly enough, we're still learning very much from the plant teachers. We see this in the, in the revival of the interest of psychedelics. We see it in neuroscience. Things like psilocybin are becoming important tools as we begin to look at the molecular basis of consciousness. We can, we can actually use psilocybin as a molecular probe in a certain way to simulate states of consciousness, and with the tools we have now, like fMRI and that kind of thing, we can give somebody psilocybin and shove them in an fMRI, and, and you know, hopefully willingly. And, uh, you know, not all scientists are demonic, uh, only some of us. But, uh, <laughs> and then we can look in that brain, we can open a window on the brain when it's having the mystical experience, and we can say, oh, this, these areas are lighting up, here's the metabolic activity and so on. Still crude, but more, more sophisticated than we've ever had before. So we're even now learning from the plant teachers. We continue to learn. And they have a lot more to teach us. Up to now, they've only shared a little bit of what they know with, uh, you know, with the indigenous peoples. Well, so one of the interesting things that's come out of this psilocybin research is it was found that Psilocybin can reliably induce a mystical experience. And what is a mystical experience? A mystical experience is a direct experience of a transcendent other. 
it's this mysterium tremendum I'm talking about, an encounter with a tremendous and usually terrifying mystery. Uh, it involves a sense of oceanic boundlessness. We know that there are certain brain structures that maintain our sense of being separate beings, separate from everything else, separate from each other. That's in the limbic system. Psilocybin temporarily removes those. So you have a feeling like, oh man, I was all one. You know, I was one with the universe. It's a real feeling. It, it, I'm not ridiculing it. It's an important element of mystical experience. It's an apprehension of the unity of all existence. Uh, you know, we're all one, we're, everything is connected, we are not separate. It's usually a mystical experience and sort of to qualify as one, it has to be transformative and profoundly meaningful, and they are. And this work is going on on Johns Hopkins right now, it has been for a while. You can actually study and reliably induce mystical experiences and then see what is the brain doing when you're having one. You can read about it, Roland Griffith, Johns Hopkins. Again, check out the Hefter Research Institute if you want to know the details. Well, it turns out that in the, around the, the time of Christ, uh, what, however you want to date that, there were, in fact, many uh, basically agrarian, matriarchal, uh, mystery religions scattered around the Middle East. And these were mushroom cults, actually, because they were agrarian, they had cattle, the cattle have, mushrooms are symbiote, symbiotes on the cattle. One of the ones, maybe the only one that survived into historical times was the so-called Eleu Eleusinian Mysteries, the Mysteries of Eleusis. It was all about the Demeter-Persephone myth and the descent of Persephone into the underworld and all that. Members of this cult of Eleusis, of Demeter, were required to make a pilgrimage to Eleusis at some point in their lives and, and when they were given a beverage. And the beverage contained, it's not totally clear, it was made from barley, but it contained probably mushrooms or and or, this is a bar relief from the temple of Demeter. The archaeologists have interpreted this as Demeter giving Persephone a flower. Does that look like a flower to you? Me neither. Looks kind of like a mushroom. Uh, but then there's also good speculation indicating that they were proud that this, this beverage that was prepared called the Kaikion uh, also contained ergot ergotized barley, and ergot is a fungus that parasitizes grasses, barley, rye, and so on. Ergot is the source of ergot alkaloids. Ergot alkaloids, well, one example is LSD. LSD is an ergot alkaloid. It's not naturally occurring. It's slightly modified uh, from the natural compound, but there are psychoactive lysergic acid derivatives. So it looks like this cult actually survived into historical times, and it's probably representative of other mystery cults that, that were scattered around the, uh, around the Mediterranean as, as you know, we sort of transitioned from the Paleolithic into, into historical times. Wait a minute. Okay. So, besides the mystical experience, other aspects of psychedelic experiences are a consistent message that come out of them, especially in a shamanic context. One of them is biophilia. You come away from these experiences feeling love or an intimate emotional attachment or attraction to all living organisms. It's a feeling, it's the love of life, literally. By E.O. Wilson kind of you know, was one of the coiners of the term, the psychiatrist Eric Fromm has said, called it a psychological attraction toward all that is alive and vital. So biophilia is something that you, a profound mystical psychedelic experiences will reliably trigger uh, this feeling. Another uh, thing that comes out of it is the sense of animism. 
you come away from these experiences with this, animism is a characteristic worldview of indigenous peoples that all non-human entities, animals, plants, and inanimate objects or phenomena have an inherent spiritual essence. This is the idea that everything is conscious, even the rocks. Consciousness is a property uh, that's built into nature. And we see it manifest more in living things, but it attributes essentially a soul, a spiritual nature, uh, to all living things. That's one of the perceptions of uh, the psychedelic experience. Another one is pantheism. Pantheism is the belief that the universe or the totality of nature is identical with the divine that God is not separate from nature, God is nature, God is eminent in nature, and that's what, you know, that's why nature is so cool, because it's not that there's an intelligent designer, nature is the intelligent designer, uh, nature itself. So you get these uh, qualities of the mystical experience, the direct experience of, of divine or transcendent reality, Biophilia, animism, all things living and non-living have a spiritual nature. Pantheism, God is not separate from nature. Nature itself is divine. So informed by the psychedelic experience in the indigenous context, these perceptions, these are not belief systems. These are empirical observations of the nature of reality. You know, if you don't believe me, go to a traditional system, uh, take a psychedelic, and, and then we'll have a conversation. <laughs> and until you do, don't bother me. <laughs> I, there's no point in arguing with ignorant people. Uh, one of the things we did in order to deal with this was we had to invent some institutions. Religion was one, but that came later. The first one was really shamanism, which has been called the Archaic Techniques of Ecstasy by Mercy Eliade, famous professor, scholar of comparative religions. Shamanism refers to a range of traditional beliefs and practices concerned with communication with the spirit world. Shamanism is a practical technology for navigating in non-ordinary states interacting with non-human intelligences encountered there and obtaining knowledge useful to individuals and the community, such as the treatment of illness, the uses of medicinal plants, the location of game, propitious times to plant or harvest, and so on. The induction of altered states of consciousness to access these realms commonly, though not invariably, involves the use of psychedelic plants or fungi. In the cultural evolution of humanity, shamanism is as old as religion itself and in many ways not different from it. One must look to shamanism to uncover the roots not only of religion but also medicine, pharmacology, chemistry, theater, art, and poetry. Wait a minute. Get it. So we had these psychedelic ecstatic matriarchal cults based on fecundity and probably a lot of uh, free love and that kind of thing. But then these were expunged and due to the rise of the so-called Abrahamic religions, the mostly Judaism and Christianity, uh, uh, Islam came later, but they're Abrahamic because they all trace back to Abraham. They have common roots. And by 396 AD, the Goths had invaded and sacked the temple of Demeter, putting an end to the last ecstatic psychedelic mystery cult in the Mediterranean. This ended the Bronze Age mystery religion and Christianity, which had begun to emerge in the first century AD, uh, but by 380 AD, it was pretty much the conquer conquest was complete. Uh, you know, it was the official state religion of the Roman Empire. So the psychedelic mystery religions disappeared. And these Abrahamic religions, especially Christianity, had a very different perspective 
on spirituality and salvation than the pagan mystery religions. Under the Abrahamic view, God and nature are separate. We're not, uh, not part. It's different. God is a judgmental and, of course, paternal, fully external, and nature and man are subordinate to God. Uh, salvation and revelation are external to nature. Salvation is not to be found in nature. Humans are not part of nature. We're subordinate. Nature is subordinate to us. Humanity in these traditions is specifically instructed to rule over and subdue the earth. So that involves what amounts to a devaluation of nature in the cultural consciousness. Pantheism gave way to monotheism. Instead of one, instead of the universe is God, there's one God outside of nature. Animism gave way to devaluation of nature. Only man has a spiritual nature. Mystical experience gave way to doctrines and dogma. Only the priests can talk to God. Direct experience of the divine is forbidden. Biophilia gave way to, uh, well, necrophilia, unfortunately. Hum Christianity and these other religions seem quite focused on the suffering, the sin, and the death. That seems to be the message that Christianity carries for us. The West is preoccupied with death, the Judeo-Christian tradition is preoccupied with death. The notion is we're inherently flawed beings. We're born into sin. Christ died for our sins. Our salvation will be found in heaven, not here on earth, in heaven. We must reject the temporal world as inherently evil. In other words, we must devalue nature. We must devalue our own biological being, existence in nature. Here in this world, we live only to suffer and to die, and we look to salvation beyond death. This may be something of a shell game. Uh, well, 2,000 years on, after living under this Christian tradition, we're witnessing the consequences of this attitude. We are raping the earth. It's not so much Christ that's suffering. That happened a long time ago. Now the entire planet is suffering under this attitude. We are poisoning the earth. I don't think anyone here would disagree with that. We're exploiting it. We're commercializing it. We're ripping out everything out of, it, out of its guts as fast as we can. We're even criminalizing nature and the earth. Uh, we're destroying it. Basically, we're destroying the planet, and we're doing it quickly, and it's not slowing down. It's, if anything, growing faster. This is a hell of a way to treat our mother, and yet we're doing it. We, uh, this is the, what we need to wake up about. So some anthropologists and evolutionary biologists have talked about the psychozoic era. We're about to enter the age of mind. And others have talked about the Anthropocene as a geological age. The Anthropocene is the current geological period, wherein human activities have a powerful effect on the global environment. And that's just kind of illustrated here. You know, we're busy uh, modifying the Earth. And what we're mostly busy doing is destabilizing the homeostatic biofeedback mechanisms maintained through this plant chemistry on a global, uh, on a global scale where we're putting such strain on the system that it tends to go back to homeostasis, but we reach a certain point where it can't do that anymore. And then we're in big trouble because we can't reverse these trends like global warming and so on. You get things like the runaway greenhouse effect and that James Lovelock and other atmospheric scientists have talked about. Once you cross a certain threshold, you can't reverse it. And the people that make policy have now reached that point and actually said, well, we can't reverse it. So we better get ready. We better, you know, it's not, no longer about stopping it. It's about, it's about it. we have to adapt to it. 
well, there's only so much adaptation we can do. Other people have talked about the Psychozoic era. That pertains to the era of geological time characterized by the presence of human intelligence. Uh, frankly, friends, I'm not sure we've reached the Psychozoic era yet. <laughs> I think we're kind of poised between that Anthropocene era, which is largely characterized by human stupidity, and the Psychozoic era has not uh, quite got here, and we better hope that it gets here pretty quick. Uh, if we're going to repair this damage that over the Anthropocene we've inflicted, and when the Anthropocene started, opinions vary, but probably about the end of the, of the uh, 14th century, the end of the 1500s, when basically the genocide of the North American native peoples had more or less been accomplished. Others say it goes even further back, back to the, the driving into extinction of the North American megafauna. But whatever it happened, we're in it now. And if we are going to make it to the psychedelic era, to the, to the psychozoic era, to the age of mind, uh, we have a couple of important tasks awaiting us. First of all, we have to wake up. We have to wake up and start having this conversation uh, with ourselves and with each other and say, yes, we're in a heap of shit. Let's acknowledge that and figure out what we're going to do about it, what can be done about it. Uh, and that's the second part of it. We have, we have to wise up. You know, we have to get wise, and we have to get wise really fast, uh, or it will all be lost. And again, I say the psychedelic plants, the plant teachers, are part of this process. We can still learn from them. They propagate the message that we need to propagate to our compatriots, this, this plant wisdom, the importance of valuing nature. Uh, I think we need to reject this notion that nature is without value or that we own it. We're part of nature. We're, you know, our job is not to own and exploit nature. Our job is to nurture it. And uh, there's very little of that going on. I mean, things may be changing but there's very little of that going on right now. And, you know, as a species, uh, we're the only species, I, I believe, that can anticipate its own death. We're the only species that can anticipate the death of its species, the death of the planet. Uh, our animals are not preoccupied with these things. We have reached, in the last few years, we're almost obsessed with the notion of the end of history and the end of the planet and you know the global geoclimatic catastrophe that brings brings the whole thing now these are almost an obsessional uh, preoccupation and i think that the plant teachers play a pretty critical role at this historical juncture because they are tools that help us to understand our place in nature, you know, our purpose in nature. If there is a plant, we, it's the same task that, that faces, faced us when, you know, that first primate reached down and plucked a mushroom from the Serengeti Plain. Learn from it about our place in nature, our nature as a species, and learn to um, appreciate nature. So hopefully, What's very encouraging is the rediscovery of these plant teachers. And you see, you hear about the globalization of ayahuasca and things like that. Ayahuasca's you know, plant that a few years ago grew in the Amazon. Nobody cared much about it. Now it's gone global. And it's become part of global consciousness. It's part of this essentially desperate message on the part of the plant teachers to say, wake up, monkeys, you know, and get the message out there to as many people as you can, so that then there can be a collective wakening up. So it may very well be, as we come to the end of this historical juncture, and possibly the end of history as we know it, that there's going to be a mushroom in our future. The question is, which one?
Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dennis McKenna.